Hi, Church. Uh, very warm welcome to our first um, Thursday morning Bible study. Obviously, it's not live, so you can access it any time you like, but it will be available from 6.30 a.m. on Thursdays. OK, we're going to be uh, studying the unsearchable riches of Christ through this Bible study, and we will be working our way through the book of Hebrews. That's how we're going to, how we're going to do that. So please do wherever you are, um, probably at home at the moment, but uh, wherever you might be, please have a, your Bible open in front of you so that you're able to um, study it follow through, meditate on it, and there'll be moments throughout the study where I ask you to pause and do a little activity, uh, and then um, you press play again and we carry on to the next bit. So there's a sense of uh, interaction in, in what's going on. Just to say a few things about uh, epistles in general and the book of Hebrews. So with an epistle, a letter, they weren't they weren't written in a vacuum. They were written to church, to a church or to churches that were facing certain issues. And so because of that, um, they they are addressing specific situations and things that are going on, which means that when you're reading an epistle, it's a little bit like listening to one side of a phone conversation. I'm sure you've experienced that, where you thought, oh, I wonder who they're talking to, and by their tone and, uh, and by the content, you try and piece it together. You almost have to do detective work. It's a little bit like that with an epistle. Sometimes you're thinking, I wonder what challenges these people are facing what strange beliefs are coming in what's going on here you have to try and work that through well to say a few things about uh, the letter to the hebrews um it would have been written before ad 70 because the the writer makes reference to the fact that at that point um the jewish priests were still ministering in the temple but we know that the romans destroyed the temple in ad 70 so it was written before AD 70 um, it's it's the one it's the one letter in the New Testament that really takes up in detail the theme of Jesus's high priest none of the other epistles do that in anywhere near um, the same way they may kind of hint at it or intimate it but this really is the only letter that goes into um, Jesus's function and role and ministry as high priest so it's very interesting straight away um, and then the other thing to say is that no one knows who wrote it, uh, which is an amazing thing, because I sometimes think to myself, you know what, I think if the Apostle Paul had written a shopping list, it would have somehow found its way into scripture um, and probably would have deserved to be there. Uh, but no one knows who wrote Hebrews. And yet it's part of the canon of scripture. And really, that, go, that, that goes a long way to, to, to say much about the, just the very richness of the content, that although no one knows who wrote it, the content itself so commends itself as part of God's word, as inspired by the Holy Spirit, that it's in scripture. So it's an amazing letter, um, often overlooked because it has some very um, tricky passages that are hard to understand. And so as a result, sometimes people don't uh, don't read it so much. Um, so it's a thrill to be able to take you through it. It's, it's far and away in my top five and maybe top three books in the whole Bible. So, uh, OK, so you've got your you've got your Bible. Um, opened and um, what we're going to I'm going to read chapter one Tuesday we're going to look at an overview of chapter one and then zone in on a few verses so we're going to be I'm going to read chapter one to you and once I've done that I'm going to um, ask you to press pause and ask you to read it through again so you've read it through twice before we dig into it so here we go long ago many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed the heir of all things through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds or spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up 
Like a garment, they will be changed, but you are the same and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you so much for this amazing portion of scripture. I pray that as we dig into it today, that your spirit would stir our hearts and would enliven our minds and would nourish our souls. We pray it for our good, but primarily we pray it for the glory and the fame of Jesus in our lives. Amen. I mean, so I'm going to ask, I'm going to um, ask, ask you to press pause. And then once you've done that, I'm going to ask you to read through chapter one again. Uh, and then unpress pause and we will, we, will, we will move on from there. So please press pause now. Welcome back. So uh, if I was to ask you the, this question as a result of, um, of your reading of chapter one again, if I was to say to you, what do you think the main purpose of the writer is here in this chapter? What do you think primarily they are trying to do through this portion? What would you say? So I'm going to ask you to press pause again. Just take a couple of minutes to ponder, to think through to yourself and just write down maybe in one sentence what you think it would be. OK, so what is the main purpose of the writer in this chapter as far as you can make out? So you're you're going to read. you're just thinking about the chapter that you've heard me read once. You've read it once. Step back. What's the main idea? What's the main thing that's going on here? OK, pause. Welcome back. So I wonder what you would have written. I think that the main um, purpose here of the writer is to demonstrate clearly that Jesus is not an angel, but more than that, that Jesus is superior to angels, that Jesus Christ doesn't fit in the category of angel. But more than that, it's not it's not just that he doesn't fit in that category, but that he is way above and way superior to angels. I'm going to ask you to just take a moment to look at verses four to five. Uh, again, and look at verse 13. Just have a look at those here. It says, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than their superior, more excellent. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you're my son, today I've begotten, to, begotten you, or again I'll be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Which of the angels has God ever said that to? And then he speaks these higher words of sonship, and then there. In verse 13, the same phrase, to which of the angels has God ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And so you can see that what he's doing there, he's trying to demonstrate. Now, why do you think that the writer would have to do that? Why do you think he's having to do that? Have a moment to have a think. OK, pause. Welcome back. I wonder what you wrote down. The reality is, and it might sound a little bit obvious, but it's important to say is that what was going on was that it seems that listening to one side of the phone conversation, that people were starting to teach strange things about Jesus, things that weren't in line with the apostles teaching. And what they were teaching were this. Jesus is an angel. Sure, he might he might be an archangel. The word arc, A-R-C-H. E in Greek means first or preeminent, so maybe one of the top angels. In fact, you know what? He's probably the top angel. But when all said and done, he's an angel. Uh, and that teaching was starting to come in. In fact, you will find certain uh, cults and sects even today would do that. The Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, they would teach that Jesus is the archangel Michael. If you get into in-depth conversations with them, that's what they believe and that's what they teach. And so this, the writer here is challenging that. Now, here's a question I want to ask you. I'm going to pause again. What is the main method that the author uses to demonstrate that Jesus isn't an angel? What's the main way he does it? He does it in a repeated way. He does it again and again and again in this chapter. But what's the main way, the main method he uses or the main 
tool tool that he employs to sort of uh, carve out his argument to show that Jesus is not an angel. Pause. Welcome back. Um, <clears throat> well, the main way is that he uses the Old Testament scriptures. And if you look down in chapter one, you will find that he does that seven times in this first section, in this first chapter. And this first chapter really, sometimes the chapters aren't very helpful in the sense that they carve things up, you know. Um, but here it can be quite helpful in the sense that it does seem to be a, the, the chapter, end of the chapter comes genuinely at a point where um, a line is drawn under the argument. And in this section, uh, there are seven Old Testament scriptures that are used. Now, in kind of Hebrew numerology, um, seven uh, numbers would represent certain things. And seven is the number of fullness or the number of completion or the number of perfection that's what the number represented you see and so he's really trying to sort of demonstrate that there is a full and a complete argument um, it's fully and completely and perfectly true from scripture that um, Jesus is Jesus is not an angel that's why he uses it seven times it's a device there that's meant to uh, make us realize there's something complete that's going on here. Um, so the fact that he uses this method, he uses the Old Testament scriptures as his method. I want to ask you two questions to think about. Number one, what does this tell us about the author's view of the Old Testament? What does it tell us about his value, the value that he puts on to Old Testament scripture? And then number two, what do you think it might tell us about the audience what or the recipients? What does it tell us about those who have received the letter that he might be doing this. So again, pause. And welcome back. Um, well, the, I think the first question is really easy. It tells us that he really values scripture uh, and therefore so should we. That though this is teaching about Jesus, who comes, who comes, as it brings in the new covenant with him, um, that actually uh, that doesn't mean for a moment that we devalue the teaching of the old covenant only that we learn to interpret it correctly but we are to absolutely value the old testament as god's authoritative word inspired by the holy spirit so we're to absolutely continue doing that what does it tell us about the recipients where well, tell us tells us pretty uh, pretty clearly that they are jews they're hebrews which is why the book has been called hebrews hebrews was not it didn't have a title none, none of these letters originally had titles their titles that we put on them the reason why we've given this book the title hebrews is because it was written to hebrews it was if you read through the book of acts you'll find that as the apostles travel around preaching sometimes in certain sermons like in acts 2 on the day of pentecost particularly then um uh and other settings where they're preaching in synagogues they use scripture a lot to back up their arguments Whereas when they're speaking to non-Jews, like in Athens in Acts 17, Paul doesn't quote scripture at all because they don't know scripture, because they don't consider scripture to be uh, have any worth or, or value. Particularly, he quotes one of their poets and then preaches the gospel from that. And so what you find is, is it's like certain sermons in Acts, this book here, Hebrews, uh, Gospel of Matthew. There's, lo there's lots of bits where it says this was to fulfill the scripture. And then quotes the Old Testament. And, and what we realize is our oh, Matthew was really aimed towards Jewish readers. So it tells us that the recipients of this letter were Jews who had who had converted out of either or out of Judaism and into um, following the Messiah, following the Christ, becoming believers or Christians. And so that's what um, that's what it tells us. Now, what we're going to do now for the for the second part of this, the study is to just zone in focus in here on the first four verses and um, it says here let's just read them again long ago many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed the heir of all things through whom also he created the world he is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Um, now, I'm going to uh, ask you 
uh, again, to just read that portion of scripture out loud slowly to yourself three times. Okay, so just read it out loud. If you're on a bus, maybe not, but you know, go over it slowly three times. Pause. Okay, now you've uh, done that. I want to just draw out some things. Um, first, I want you to notice that this really, this short paragraph here sums up the entire letter to the Hebrews. It's very clever. It is a summary of the entire letter. Essentially, the point being made through the entire letter is that in the old dispensation, before Jesus came, before the eternal son of God took on flesh, um, was born as Jesus of Nazareth, before that, God spoke in many ways. God, we have the Old Testament as evidence that God has spoken in extraordinary ways, particularly through the prophets. Amazing things. And, it, and it's truly God. It's the true, unchanging creator of heaven and, on, and of earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of Israel. It's the same God. He has spoken. Uh, and so we're to honour all that has gone before. And we're to honour all that God has said. But there has now been a final word spoken. God has spoken finally in his son. There's something conclusive and complete and full about the revelation of who God is and God's plan for humanity and God's plan of salvation in the revelation of his son. And in that sense, all that came before points towards and leads up to this revelation of Jesus Christ. It serves this ultimate revelation. That really is the point of the whole letter. And the exhortation or the appeal in the letter is don't go back to that because now the fullness has come. And even though following Jesus may create intense difficulty and pressure in your life, whatever you do, don't go back because going back now that the full revelation of God's plan in Jesus has come to light would, would lead you to a place where you're essentially turning your back on God's way of salvation. That's really the that's the the essence of the entire the entire letter there. Um, and so I want I want to ask you now, just looking at this first portion, I'm going to ask you to um, write down how many things are said about Jesus. What are them? If you think about the things that are said about the um, the character, uh, the person of Jesus, what are the main, how many main things are said? Okay, pause. Welcome back. I wonder how many you found. The answer is seven. There we go again, back on seven, you see, because the author, it's a device. The author is saying, look, I want you to know, um, I'm speaking about the one who is the fullness, the perfect revelation of God, and um, I'm telling you seven times. Um, there's plenty of other things he could have said about Jesus. These ones are particularly relevant to the points he wants to make. But also, not only that, they are particularly, it's particularly he chose seven as a way of saying that this is complete. He is the complete revelation. And so we're going to dig into some of these next time that we um, do this. But for now, just to um, highlight them, number one, that Jesus is the heir of all things, that the Father has entrusted all things to him. And the whole idea of uh, inheritance and sonship is something that's not so immediate to our mind in our culture, but it's huge, biblical times. So as the son, he's the heir of all things. Secondly, that he is the agent of creation, that, that when we hear about God creating all things by his word, we realise as the biblical revelation unfolds that his word was more than just words, but there is someone called the word. And so... God creating through his word is God creating through his son, through Jesus. Secondly, that he is the radiance or the shining forth of God's glory. So if we think of the the um, majestic, weighty um, uh, splendor of who God is, that in the same way that the rays of the sun are the radiance of the sun's glory, Jesus is the outshining of the glory of God. Um, number four, that he is the exact representation of God's nature, that he is the stamp, uh, not just of God's likeness. He's the stamp of God's nature, God's essential being as uh, divine, eternal. He is the exact stamp of his nature, Jesus himself being eternal and divine. 
fifthly that he's the sustainer of all things not only did he create all things as the word of god but that he upholds all things by his powerful word sixthly that he as high priest has made purification through his offering he has made purification of for sins he's, he's done it um, the job has been done and then number seven and as a result he is now exalted and he is seated at the right hand of god far above and beyond all other spiritual beings so this is the these are the truths that we see and we can dig into these a bit more next week but i want to just ask you uh, as the final thing now in this study to take uh, one of these just pick up one of those that is the heir of all things the agent of creation the radiance of god's glory the exact representation of his nature the sustainer of all things the high priest um, that he's uh, ascended and exalted and at the right hand of the father and I want you to just ask you over this day or maybe over these days, just to ponder, are there any, as you take one of those truths, is, are there any other scriptures? Well, there will be. But can you find any other scriptures that underline and highlight this truth? Number two, for you to meditate on that. And what I mean is, is that you, you throw it around your mind and your heart. You ponder it. You pray it in. You rehearse it. You, you mutter. You, the word meditate means mutter. You engage your your prayers and your and your words to look to look to put words to it to get it into you in that way and and joined with that thirdly that you practice how you might explain this truth to someone okay you practice how would i explain that this is who jesus is and also pray for an opportunity to do so sometimes we can accidentally become so cliched in our uh, declaration of jesus that it becomes a bit one-dimensional there's so much we can say about him and god can use any one facet of who jesus is to completely change someone's life so to practice how you might explain this to someone and then pray lord give me an opportunity to do so today or give me the boldness to create an opportunity to do this today or tomorrow or, or over this week so i hope that that's helpful for you Think of any other scriptures that might um, reinforce this truth and, and add a kind of um, texture and uh, richness to it. Meditate on it. Pray it in. Let it go around your mind and your heart. Um, practice how you might articulate it and pray for an opportunity to do so. God bless you, um, even though you way to open up God's word and to know that there will be um, people that... Uh, engage with this and take this on and i trust that god will as he always does own his word as we as we come in faith own his word to bring fresh nourishment to our souls okay lots of love uh, see you here or there